Hello. Visiting Bullwood the other day for a look at Rob Roy's grave, I got talking to a local farmer, and he said to me, here, there's something I would like to ask you. Of all the places you've seen in Scotland, if you had your choice, where would you choose to live? He was very surprised when I told him I would live where I live now, to the north of Glasgow, between, in fact, the Forth and the Clyde. Now, the reason why I say that is because this is where three quarters of the Scottish population live. It's a very easy region to get around. There's good public transport and a great choice of varied country. North, the Highlands, of course, up Loch Lomond side, and you're there. If you go west, you're into the estuary. And if you go east, beyond Stirling and to Stirling, you've got that marvellous variety of country. Then the hills that rise above the, the plains, the Ochels, where we go now. A guy wet day, cold too, that's why I'm wearing the gloves. But a great glen to be in, because you've got to come out on a wet day to see waterfalls at their best. And this is one of the notable things about Tilly Coultry Glen, the town of the hill foots. And the remarkable thing is that this glen would be inaccessible, but for one of the first job creation schemes in Scotland. When the people of Tilly Coultry in 1925 decided they would make application to get this glen for recreation. There's a lot of unemployed in the town. They managed to get a 75% grant and the unemployed men were put to work bridging and building staircases up a glen which is remarkable by any standard. A place of enormous beauty. But here's a strange paradox. 1926 was the year of the general strike. And when the men started work on the 5th of May, the general strike had been on two days. And everybody in the village of Tillicultry, the small town of Tillicultry, had stopped work because of the strike. But the men pressed on because they were so glad to be getting the luxury of wages. Well, what a tremendous place. Bridge after bridge, staircases of stone, the river buttressed by parapets, going through natural gorges, and all of it inaccessible until that marvellous Glen Road was built. And incidentally, when I mentioned the 75% grant, that only paid for the wages. The rest of the money was raised by local subscriptions, and I think that's quite a feat, but these people really loved their glen. The folks of Tilly Coultry not only loved it, but in the early days, it was a source of power because they needed something for their looms. Originally it had been hand weaving, and now the water was turning the wheels, the tweed, the tartan, the serge was coming out. Not only a place of beauty, a place of utility. great when you come to the sluices where the water pours out through a semi-rotten wooden barricade. There used to be a dam there controlled by a great anchor affair and when it was opened up the water could flow to the eight mills that were ready to receive it and their water wheels get the looms working. You can always enjoy a normally wet day in a barn.
There's one day that people have never forgotten. It's still talked about, although it happened a hundred years ago this year, the great flood of Tillicoultry. And what happened was this. Six o'clock in the morning, it had been raining solidly all, all night, and it was still coming down as people went to work. The mill started at six in these days. They thought it was heavy rain, but at half past seven, it grew so dark that people had to light the gas and then they saw what rain really was. It fell out of the sky, hail water as they called it in these days, in other words, in sheets. And when they saw the hills, they'd been hidden for a wee while. What they saw was white water coming from the very tops and converging in that glen. And what came onto Tillicoultry in a sudden rush, like a great wave that burst the burn was all that water gathered up smashed the mills, swept people away, filled up the houses to knock the walls of some of the houses down to let out the water. And it left absolute devastation in its wake. A very good example that the burn that supplies you with the power for your industry can also be your enemy. And thinking of Tillicoultry. Now way back in the time of Mary Queen of Scots, they were using the sheep off the hills to supply the wool to weave cloth in a very primitive way, working the foot pedals, no doubt, or even just doing it by hand. And then by the 18th century, they were well into productivity. They were making a serge known as Tillicoultry serge, which sold at 5p a yard. And then in the Franco Wars of around uh, 1860, army uniforms, and in the First World War, the soldiers were wearing khaki made in Tillicoultry. So the growth has been steady. Times have changed today. The mills are finding it difficult, so they've gone on to knitwear. Other industries have come to Tillicoultry. A thriving, beautiful place with a community that really think there's no place like Tillicoultry. Well, you probably saw there was a dramatic change of weather there because the following morning, after that first bit of the picture was taken, we had one of these glorious changes, the air clear and the village sparkling. Well, the water is still being used from these hills, although it doesn't feed the mills anymore. It's collected in reservoirs in Glen Devon. That's the pass that goes right across the Ochos and joins up, the road joins up with the A9. But we're going along further east than that, into that lovely low country with the wee villages with names like the Yetz and Muckert, and just down a bit, Rumbling Bridge. Now that's a country of great antiquity. You're coming up towards Kinross, and most of Kinross, when it was a borough, was water. Loch Leven, with two wee towns on the edge of it, Milnathorpe and Kinross. Well, where we're going under the Ben Arty is a very special island. There's a great atmosphere about Loch Leven. It's not that it's a particularly big loch. It's three and a half miles long by two and a half miles wide. It's the hills, the feeling of space, the way it reflects the sky. And of course, it isn't really an, an absolutely natural loch because way back in 1826, the loch was reduced in size to win more land for agriculture and to enable sluices to be built to supply water to the paper mills. And yet the whole feeling is rather special. And it's peculiar because it's got the same feeling as the Lake of Menteith for the same reason. It's got an island with a castle on it. And on both castles, Mary Queen of Scots lived. She was a prisoner on Loch Leven. She was only a temporary prisoner at the Lake of Menteith. And it's Loch Leven that's got this very, very specially sad story and the sad life of that Scottish Queen. Willie Thompson. 
you've been the custodian of Loch Leven Castle for quite a long time now. I've read the history book accounts of how Mary Queen of Scots escaped, but you've got your own ideas, you don't really believe them. No, I don't, Tom, I have my own ideas. And I've got them through study of the Stuarts. Now, when Mary Queen of Scots escaped from here, I don't think she actually escaped. They let her go. They did? Yes. Why? Well, I think she fell into another trap. They wanted to know where her army was, and the only way they could find out where that army was was let her go, and she would lead them to it. And that's just what she did do. But how about the accounts of the lifting of the keys and all the rest of it? You know, we know the story of how the governor was at his meal yes. and the page dropped his napkin over the That's keys, yes, lifted it away, slipped them to her, uh, slipped her away and then locked the, the party it, inside. Yes, that's quite correct. That actually did happen. But that was late happen. Because otherwise, if they'd done it any other way, she would have known that she was going into a trap. How about the other parts of the story then, about the earring and all that? Well, you see, as I say to you, the only way they can get her confidence is by acting it and doing it the way they want it to do. What she thought, that she was that a trusting person, that they were going to help her. And instead of helping her, they turned against her. As she follow her, from the time she left Loch Leven, to the time she got to Langside. And when she got to Langside, what was there? Nothing. Her army were defeated before she was there. And then she fled south. To the Solway, at Dundrenan? Yes, yes. Dundrenan Castle. She went to the monks. Now the monks arranged passes for her to go to France. And when she boarded the boat in the Solway first, a gale sprung up and forced the boat into Workington. And that's where she was taken prisoner. She was taken to Cockermouth, then to Carlisle, and she was in prison for 18 years after that. If there'd been no gale that night, Tom, Mary Queen of Scots would have been back in France. How do you think she was treated here? Well? Oh, yes, she was well looked after here. Until she tried to escape herself dressed as a maid. Well, that was the March escape? Yes. When she dressed up as a laundry maid? Uh, yes, and she went to the boatman and asked the boatman to take her to Kinross. And when he asked her who she was, she never replied. And he stretched his hand over to take the scarf away from her face. And he saw the ring on her finger and he brought her back in again. And once she was brought in, she was never out of that gate again. That's the gate that we went yes, through that's today. that's the gate we went through today. And in these days, Willie, this island was much smaller than it is now. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The water was tight on the walls. Aha. Uh -huh. So when she got to the, the tower, she had to get from there directly into a boat into lapping a boat. the wall. Yes, she had to wait at the tower window till Willie Douglas come round with a boat for her. Then she went down a rope ladder into the boat and she was taken straight across the lock. What kind of a prison life had she, Willie? Well, she was in that one room and she was allowed out to walk the wall twice a day. Now, you've been round the wall with me, Tom. You see her walk. Not very much. Not very far. Of course, as you say, the island was much smaller. And that was the size of it. And off she could walk. She was never outside. Her loving quarters were comfortable. And she had a maid and a page, Molly Douglas. But she was watched, everything oh, she did yes, by Lady Douglas. Yes, yes, because... She was the real... Yes, she was, she, she was the one. But every time she left and come down the stairs to go for her walk, the guard was with her. And he used to wait and watch her walk and then take her down and take her inside again. Was it really a trap? Was it connived by the governors to lead Mary into a confidence trick which would take her to Langside and be defeated. Willie's absolutely sure that was right. I wonder if he is right.
Well, whether Willie is right or not, it made a grand outing to Loch Leven to hear another side of the story. And if you go down below Kinross to the Fisheries Pier, a very short sail across will take you to that island and you can hear Willie talking first hand about it. Or if you don't want to do that, go round the loch a wee bit and there's a Royal Society for the Protection of, of Birds Reserve where you'll get great fun. But wherever you go, it's a loch for all seasons. Well, I think most of you will know that I'm a Glasgow man. In fact, born in Springburn, but I spent my last living years in Springburn on the top of Algray Hill. And from the room where I used to do my writing, I could see the Arden Hills standing above the houses of Paisley. But the curious thing is that for years, even when I started climbing, I'd never been down the Clyde and examined that particular island, which is a little epitome of everything that Scotland has. And the reason why I didn't go there was I thought there'd be too many folk. In these days, because I lived in Glasgow, I had to get into the wilds and get it as remote as it could be possibly got. And then I went there one weekend, and it was the fair weekend. Oh, the pressure was terrific in the trains. But whenever I left Brody and get into the hills, I was on my own. In fact, I saw nobody until I got back to Brody in the Monday morning. Peace at an easy price. Captain Roddy Murray, great morning for a sail. Yes, sir, as you're seeing uh, this uh, piece of water at its best. It's a lovely morning. Uh, it's not the same in the, w in the winter time when uh, you have uh, wind speeds of uh, 30 knots into our drossing. This uh, ship, uh, the Caledonia, flies between our drossing and Roddick. And uh, in the winter time, she she carries 135 passengers and uh, uh, eight, uh, 61 ton of cargo. In the summer time, she carries 650 passengers and 135 ton of cargo. Is it 12 miles of stormy water occasionally? Yes, it's 12 nautical miles from uh, Brodick to Ardrossan. Stormy, yes, very stormy. So at the end of the day, that 10 miles of water is the strength of Aaron when they rely on tourism for their livelihood, don't you think? I agree with you. It's a lovely island. As you say, they depend on tourism and people who love Aaron, who genuinely love Aaron, would, would get over there and enjoy their holiday. Thank you very much, Captain. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. What a glorious morning to be in the island of Arran. I never guessed it when I got up in the dark this morning. 
And here, after only an hour in the boat, I'm into another little highland world. The word Arran means high island, and right above me is Goat Fell, 2,866 feet. And from the top, I've seen it in clear days, you can see Ireland, the Isle of Man, the peaks of the Lake District, and a vast array of highland hills. I'd like to recite a wee poem. Rome, Athens and Greece, I'd see them before I die, but I'd rather not see any one of the three than be exiled forever from Skye. Well, what's Skye got to do with Aaron? This, Alexander Nicholson was one of the greatest of Skye men. He was the first man to climb Skour Alasdair. And when he came to Aaron, he said it was even more enjoyable than Skye. The reason being that it was smaller, yet no less wild. But most of all, it was the condition of the inhabitants that he was pleased with. They were so prosperous compared to the folks of Skye. Well, that prosperity in Arran really springs from the tourist trade because tourists have been coming to Arran for the best part of a hundred years and more. The first people who came were the Paisley weavers, the hand loom men. They used to come over in sailing boats from Salkots and they used to come here to drink the goat's milk and walk about Glen Rosa because the goat's milk and the fresh air were reckoned just to put you right. But the big thing that happened really to direct another class of people to Arran was the coming of the, the railway to Ayr and the first service of boats from Ardrossan to ply in a regular fashion, making that short journey that today just takes a matter of an hour. The journey is only 12 miles by sea, and I think the popularity of Arran really stems from the magic of this place, of the Hebridean feeling, the green shore, because it is essentially an island where people have lived for so long that cultivation is everywhere, the hand of man is always evident, and yet on the north side of the island you've got these peaks rising up a spine like the Coolins, and yet when you go over the other side of the high road that crosses Arran, a different kind of country, a lowland country, when you're into the sandstone of the southern part of Arran. So we've really got two worlds here. Well, Alexander Nicholson wrote another line or two about Skye. He said, And if you're a delicate man, and of a wetting or shy, I'd rather you know before you go, you better not think of Skye. Well, Arran is something the same. It's a remarkably wet place when the, the clouds boil round Goat Fell and the big Atlantic winds come. But the remarkable thing is how quickly this climate can change. The island itself is roughly 20 miles by 10 miles. And I don't think there's probably anywhere in the world where so much variety is encompassed in such small space. Well, that's me away off to have a closer look at some of the fine bits of Arran. We'll be showing one or two films. I actually worked in Arran for a time as a farmer's boy, and we'll be looking at the farm that I used to work on, and we'll be looking at the top of Goat Fell and the view from it. But, although I want you to look at these films, I wouldn't like you to make them a substitute for the real thing, because when you're in a place like Arran, it works upon the imagination and you should always try and get the real experience.